All right, welcome to Lab Day. It's the Ballistics Pendulum. And if you're just joining us, because I just now hit record, we're at the step now where we're measuring the mass of our projectile. And by our best judgment, we're going to call this 1.8 um, grams. So the mass of the dart equals 1.8 grams, which is equal to 0 0.0018 kilograms. Dang it. All right, so that's something that doesn't really need to go in the data table. It's, it's going to be constant. We're not going to change the mass of the dart. All right, so far, so good. Now we need to get the mass of our pendulum. And we might say, note the, we're relying on the, the physics of an inelastic collision here. So it has to stick together. So you might notice that there is uh, Velcro, okay, on the tip of this dart. And so we have a Velcro target here. And it says that this is 0 0.045 kilograms. Great, we don't even need to weigh it. It's just listed for us. But we should always check that. <laughs> All right, so 10 grams or more. It is not less than 10 grams. Some of these pendula are weighted, so they'll have sort of weights on them. Um, we just need to know sort of what the, the weight is, the, the mass. Remember, mass is inertia, and so the more mass, the greater tendency to resist change in motion. So by using sort of a less massive pendulum, we should observe more motion, right? So when the momentum of the dart is delivered into the system, it's going to move more if it's lighter because it has less inertia, less tendency to resist change in motion. So the dart itself is about two grams and the pendulum is close to eight, not quite though. And this might actually be too light. Um, we don't want there to be slack in the pendulum string upon impact. And so if it rises too far up in our gravity field, we'll lose sort of the trigonometry we're relying on to, to do the calculations if we get a curved line in our, in our triangle. So that looks pretty good to me, maybe a little bit above. And so it's, I think it's almost exactly eight grams. And so, if you look there carefully, you can maybe see that that's, that's pretty much right on the dot, 8.0 grams. So the mass, and make the, the subscripts D for dart, P for pendulum very clear that, you know, they can look kind of similar if you don't make it clear. The mass of the pendulum is going to be 8.0 grams, which is 0 0.008 kilograms, right? Move the decimal point over three places to the left, divide by a thousand because there's a thousand grams in a kilo. So we're looking now at this so far, right? We know the mass of our dart and the mass of our pendulum. Moving right along here. Let's change views so that I can sort of a bit. Oh, don't, don't drop it. Let's go ahead and set up our ballistic pendulum apparatus here. So we got a guy like this. Go on the table right there. All right, so I'm kind of building these. Got another one here. Distance away, it doesn't really matter what that distance is. Of 
before I secure this one. I want to be sure to put my pendulum on. So I, I would like this to sort of have as true of a motion as possible, sort of moving backwards. All right, so that's maybe a good view right there. And the way that it is now, it's like this, this side is just a little bit shorter than this side. So it's, you know, if it moves, it's gonna sort of wobble. And the assumption that we're making, which isn't sort of exactly perfect, is that all of the kinetic energy that's delivered into this thing is gonna be converted into potential energy as it moves up in Earth's gravity field. Well, that's not exactly true. And it's even less true if there's sort of rotational motion this way, like that costs energy to sort of wobble this thing sideways. So we want sort of as, as good of a shot as possible at the center of mass and have this thing sort of move this way. And so I'm just gonna try to adjust maybe this as best as I can um, ahead of time. It's always, I think, good rule of thumb doing lab work to take time up front to make sure that your apparatus is well built, well set up, like when we study circuits, you know, take the time to make sure you've got a good sort of operational circuit before you just jump in there and start, you know, measuring currents or whatever it might be. Unfortunately, this is the type of tacit knowledge that one can only gain by doing in the science lab. So I'm the one that's getting all of the, the good knowledge here and I'm the one that's doing this. But you all maybe get some benefit by taking a look at it. So it's kind of like, I can't just like teach you, you know, how to tie a better knot. It's just like, you gotta have to just kind of figure it out. You know, you like you took Boy Scouts, I don't know all the best knots, you know, how to solve this problem here. All right, now we need to know the length of the pendulum string. So we'll measure from sort of the center of mass to the top here. And that value is 0.61 meters. So capital L length of the pendulum string, and it is 0 0.61 meters. So far, so good. All right. We really want to know what is the angular sort of displacement that is swept out by the pendulum. If you take a look at this apparatus, Here's a ballistic pendulum, okay? And you can see that it's got a projectile launcher. You fire a projectile out of it. It goes to a catch. This catch has a no, you know, would have a known mass. You could weigh it. And it's designed to sort of move this marker. So it's measuring out the actual angle. So you can see that this is in sort of degrees here. This would be a 25 degree angular displacement. And so this is kind of like a experiment in a box, right? That, you, you know, it's the same lab here. We're doing this the same procedure here. We're just sort of using different apparatus, but this is such a sort of a standard physics experiment that like they, they sell it, you know, the ballistic pendulum apparatus, just kind of like this. And maybe we'll take a look at firing this, you know, before the end of the day. 
<clears throat> so we, we kind of want to know the angular displacement that this thing is going to sweep out sort of this way. Like, what's this angle? So one you know, strategy might be to get a protractor here and try to measure that directly. What we really want to know is the height, right? We're using energy conservation. To get back to today's essential question, it says, how can we use the laws of conservation of energy and momentum to determine the muzzle velocity of a projectile launcher? So we really are relying on the idea that the kinetic energy of the dart upon impact is delivered, the momentum of it is delivered into this system. And so there's going to be some shared kinetic energy between that dart and this pendulum because it's sticky, it's moving together. It's that situation where it's one new object moving with a common velocity to kind of mimic the language that was used in yesterday's calculation. So it's increasing some height. So like here's zero. So it's like we always measure potential energy relative to some zero. Um, and it's somewhat arbitrary what that zero point is. It kind of depends on the problem. So it makes sense to call this elevation zero because this is as low as this pendulum can get. Even though that like this dart is at the same elevation, even though this dart is at the same elevation, it wouldn't make sense to call it zero for the dart if you give the dart a chance to fall to the table or even further to the floor. So it's like, depending on where you allow it to fall to, you should maybe call that point zero. But for our system here, it's like relative to this zero, how high up can the pendulum go? And so it could go up as high as I suppose here, like it was all the way sort of horizontal, in which case the height would be equal to L, the, the length of this string. I think I just ruined my whole high there. So I'm going to go ahead and use the panacea to cure all so the physics fails here in the lab. Okay. And I'll remeasure the length also just to be sure we're still at 0.61. I don't want this to Quick update, 0.615 meters, okay? 0.615 meters for L now. So as was explained in the video yesterday, rather than measuring like H directly, it'd be like laying a ruler down vertically behind it and trying to judge sort of like, if this is zero, how high up did it go? That's, that's a difficult thing to measure. It may lead to uncertainties. The easiest measurement to make is going to be the horizontal displacement. So laying the ruler down underneath the pendulum, taking a vantage point like this. Okay, we're basically, we can eyeball where the pendulum is lined up on zero here. So the pendulum is basically at about 20 centimeters. Okay, it's so like directly underneath that 20 centimeter mark is the pendulum. So we can kind of show it. See that? That's a pretty good view, I suppose. Okay, so zero is 20 centimeters. As we fire projectiles into this, like how far this way does it go? All right, horizontally. And then as was explained yesterday, calculate that angle theta that we could measure directly with a protractor, right? So it's like there's different ways to go about collecting the data with your lab work. And the more physics you know, sort of the better off you are because you can say, oh, here's a clever way we could, you know, do this. So the more math, the more fun. All right. So the projectile launcher, I'm just going to kind of use my best dart throwing motion here to, to sort of get it onto this um, Velcro pad. And then can anybody anticipate a problem with that? So it's like, we're gonna launch the dart and it's kind of like, I'll go like that, right? And so it's, you know, because I'm using a, a manual dart launcher, like literally my hands, it may not be the most consistent way to sort of achieve this uh, experimental data plus muzzle velocity. It's like, 
well, what's you know, like, it's like the dart throwing velocity. That's not the essential question. So we're going to need this guy right here. If it's not this, what is it, you guys? Exactly. Everyone was silent. Yes, no. Nothing. Okay. It's either it's nerf or it's nothing. All right. I will train my eyes upon the ruler, shoot at point blank range, because again, I'm relying sort of on an inelastic collision where the dart has to stick to this velcro. If it hits and bounces off, we're not, you know, we need to do a, a the technical term is a redo or, or a do over. So here we go. So again, because this was so light, okay, so like eight grams, um, it, it displaced, I think, like all the way back here to the to the 50 centimeter mark. Like, so it kind of went like this, okay. What we could do is keep the camera at that vantage point that I showed you a moment ago. And like, I've had students in the past record this with like their, their slow motion video camera and then replay the tape back and get very accurate horizontal displacement. Right. Let's take a look at what these uh, calculations look like now with that first um, data point collected. And so the horizontal displacement, we're calling that X, and that's going to be equal to 0.3 meters because the zero is at 20 centimeters and it was displaced back to the 50 centimeter mark. So that's 30 centimeters or 0.3 meters. Let's head on over to the whiteboard. So the larger whiteboard to do to look at what these calculations uh, look like now. Yeah. All right, let's see what the uh, what the calculations look like. This will be sort of your example, and we'll collect some more data points with different projectile launchers. So Really, our, our independent variable today will be the different types of projectile launchers that we got. All right. So the first thing that we want to do is calculate this angle. So we had the pendulum like this, and then it moved up to some height. And we want to calculate this angle here because we can relate that angle to this height, which is really what we want to know to do our energy calculation by L minus L cosine theta. Okay, the entire pendulum length is L. But if you look at it, you've measured this horizontal displacement X, so you kind of see that this triangle here has a component of L, L cosine theta. So the entire length minus this component here, L cosine theta, right? This is adjacent, so the cosine the angle times. I find this is also L, right? Like this is still L. So this triangle has like this side L. It moves up in Earth's gravity field. This is still L, right? It's still a big length. That's why we can't slacken the line. And maybe there was slack in the line, right? For that, that attempt. So we just sort of recognize that as the scientists doing the lab and say, oh, maybe our inclusion here will suffer as a result of that. So we never have a triangle with the US trip line. Right? You know, with this traffic field. So then we've got this much of the length here is L cosine theta. So if we take L cosine theta away from L, we've got H, the height that is raised in our scalp. So we need to get theta first, right? So we know what this term is, L cosine theta. We know L is 0.615. So, so we need to figure out um, theta. We know X. 
0.3, right? 0.3 centimeters. That was the horizontal displacement we just measured. And we know the hypotenuse now. So if we know opposite, we know hypotenuse, which is a sine function. That's helpful. So the inverse sine of x to l equals theta. You see that published also on the first row in the data table underneath, you know, theta. So it's going to be what? 0.3 over 0.615. So what is that, about 30 degrees? Let me do that in the calculator, please. Because it's about a half, right? Sine 30 is a half. Yeah. And then I'll double check. So if you take the ratio of sides, 0.3 divided by 0.615, you get about a half of 0.48. If you take the inverse sine of that, and it's about 30 degrees, 29.19. So theta equals 29 degrees for that. From theta, we can calculate the height. So it's going to be 0.615 minus. 0.615 times the cosine of 29 degrees. So calculate this term first. Right? Sometimes students do 0.615 minus 0.615 and they get zero. But then you do that times the cosine of 29, it's going to be zero. You want this term kind of in parentheses, like L cosine theta is that much. It's subtracting away from L. You have to kind of think about it like that. But this is going to be. A certain change, you know, less than L, we got to deduct from. So 29 cosine times 0.615 gives us this is 0 0.5379. And so 0.615 minus that, this is the L cosine theta. So my calculator, I can just make that negative, toggle it over to negative, and add it to. 0 0.615 is basically the same. So I get a 0.615 minus 0.53789 equals the height of 0 0.077 meters. Okay, because L is in meters, 0.615 meters is in meters. So we're getting seven centimeters. So, like, does that seem reasonable? Let me just sort of, uh, you know, notice that a moment ago. Does that thing raise seven centimeters? Or maybe, you know, these measurements are off. Right? Oh, it's sort of critical up here to the high point. If we got the height, we can calculate the potential energy due to gravity at maximum height. Right? So, at this height, how much energy does this thing possess, you know, sort of due to gravity? So, that's going to be the potential energy equals. Now, it was the combined masses because the dark stuck to the pendulum. So we have their masses. Both of them increase this height in Earth's gravity field, which is equal to 9.81 newtons per kilogram, 9.81 meters per second squared, right? the acceleration due to gravity. So the combined masses would be the sum of, remember those two numbers there. So 0 0.0018 plus 0 0.008 is 0 0.0098 kilograms times 9.81 newtons per kilogram times 0 0.077 meters. So we're going to get kilograms canceling new meters, which are joules of energy, joules of potential energy. We just calculate this now. Times 9.81 times 0 0.0098 equals 0 0.0074 joules. Very, very low in kilograms, right? Not a lot of weight, all right? Not that much of a height change either. And a joule is a lot of energy, right? So hardly any energy at all. There's 0.0074 joules. 
we're making the incorrect assumption, but it's just kind of the best we can do, that all of this potential energy was equal to the kinetic energy here. What we could really say is that there was at least that much kinetic energy, right? Like that energy had to come from somewhere. Well, it came from the kinetic energy upon impact. Like they had this kinetic energy they were moving up and then Earth decelerated. So you can kind of think about like gravity was doing work on this to slow it down, right? That's the energy, the work that gravity did to slow it down. To a stop at this point, right? It was moving back down. <clears throat> but there was more kinetic energy upon impact than shows up here in reality, right? Because there was uh, all of the motion was translational. Like there's, you can't help it. There's a little bit of wall that cross energy that was rotated, a little bit of sound energy, a little bit of heat energy. So other forms of energy, sort of that uh, that kinetic energy was transferred into along the way, like crashing into air particles, you know, the whole way. So fluid friction, um, you know, drag forces, you know, friction against air. That's going to work. This whole displacement, the actual path that it took to sort of arc, right, um, would be like the, the displacement times the force that the wind was sort of, you know, the air was exerting on it. There would be some sort of energy losses there, too. We've seen calculations like that before, like the wingsuit man, um, and how like the, the friction sort of, you know, affected the motor, the drag. So there was at least as much kinetic energy. We know there was more than that, but we'll just sort of use this as like a, uh, a lower limit. So we'll equate this to the kinetic energy. To say that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. And again, get back to the essential question. How are we using the laws of conservation of energy? Here's where the energy conservation comes in. We calculate the potential energy by measuring X and calculating this and calculating this, and calculating this. Right, so we measure the energy and we're making the assumption that all that energy came from kinetic energy. Again, not exactly valid, but okay. And so if that's the kinetic energy, we know that kinetic energy is equal to one half mass, and then both masses, times V squared. And we use this V prime typically for inelastic collisions. This is like that common velocity. I realize that may be a little bit tough to, to see that. So we've got kinetic energy, which we know is equal to the potential energy, which we calculated in point zero zero seven four joules, equals one half the combined masses is still point zero zero nine eight kilograms, and they traveled with some shared velocity v prime, but the kinetic energy equation is one half m v. Wait. So now we can solve for V prime. Okay, now we can solve for V prime. So let's multiply both sides by two, divide both sides by this, and then take the square root. So it's going to be V prime equal to the square root of right, uh, two times that over that. So I just skipped a bunch of algebra steps, right? But hopefully you can sort of just follow that. Multiply both sides by two, two times this. Divide both sides by this. And then to get rid of the square, take the square root. So V prime should be equal to this. Two times 0 0.0074 divided by 0 0.0098 and all that's underneath the radical. So take the square root of 15.1 and that thing. The system of the dark and the pendulum move together with a shared velocity, a common velocity, V prime of 3.9 meters per second. Okay. Now we use momentum conservation. You may recall that we said that the kind of the tricky thing about energy conservation is that we just discussed it a moment ago. That kinetic energy showed up as this much potential energy, but we know that there was more energy than that, right? Because energy can exist in so many different forms that there's energy transformations like heat energy, you know, sound energy, all those energies for sort of forms weren't created, right? Energy is not created or destroyed. So it came from sort of the energy that was like stored inside of the spring, inside of the projectile launcher, right? So you can trace the energy sort of back ever further and it's kind of a fun, fun game to play. Where did all the energy come from? So now we're going to use momentum conservation. And, and the thing here is that remember, we said the noteworthy statement was there is nothing into which momentum can be converted. So 
there was momentum in that guard as it traveled with mass and velocity. All is there in the system afterwards. So the initial momentum all comes from the dart. The mass of the dart comes from the initial velocity of the dart. To be very, very formal, you should say, well, there's two objects involved in this. What about the pendulum? Well, the mass of the pendulum and the initial velocity of the pendulum, because the initial velocity of the pendulum is zero, it's stationary, we can kind of say, yes, it's technically true that it's the sum of the individual momentum, all the particles that's equal to the total momentum. But because this thing doesn't contribute, it's really just sort of like that turns into play, right? So the initial momentum all comes from the start. The final momentum is now this, this new object, equal in mass to the sum of the masses, this value, moving at that shared common velocity in front. Okay. So we've got the initial momentum equals the final momentum. This is what the equation looks like for. An inelastic collision. It's only when the collision is inelastic that you have like this one object on the side of the equation. Oftentimes, two things collide and bounce off. You know, you got a practice problem, you got to look at it. Two objects collide and bounce off. So, this, this is sort of evidence of okay, they stuck together, right? It's like some, some object that has a common speed, right? They just have to share that law. The Velcro insurance is going on. So, now we've got um, to calculate our claim, what was the muzzle velocity? How fast did that dart, you know, travel out of the uh, projectile launcher? So we'll divide each side by the mass of the dart, and we've got the initial velocity of the dart equal to the combined mass of point zero zero nine eight kilograms divided by just the mass of the dart, which was point zero zero one eight kilograms. So those units will cancel times the prime, which was 3.9 meters per second. The units are always a sanity check on your calculation. This would be like if I'm expecting speed meters per second, then the unit should give me that. And so it would be the mass would cancel to get meters per second. So 3.9 times this ratio, 0 0.0098 divided by 0 0.0018. 5.4 times 3.9. We are claiming that this thing was traveling 21.2 meters per second times 2.23. That's about 47 miles per hour. And so you could say, like, this, and that's kind of what I mean about, like, okay, is that fast, is that slow, 21 meters per second, is that what the meter per second for an American? 47 miles per hour. Then we have a more familiarity. Like, oh, that's kind of fast, I guess. You know, was that thing really going 47 miles per hour? Or if it wasn't, what sort of results would, would cause us to get, you know, air that's like too big? Maybe it all comes back to, I mean, think about all of this was based upon what? A single data point where we said X, the horizontal displacement was 30 centimeters, right? So it's all based upon that. And then I, you know, it's based upon the other measurements we made. But you might say, yeah, we might need a better way to really determine that, you know, sort of more accurate way. But this is at least a run through of what the calculations look like. So every time you, know, you fire a dart into that thing, um, you know, you're going to go through these calculations. 11 o'clock right now, there's 40 minutes left in class. Is there a volunteer that wants to fire the, the projectile launcher into the target? Who among you? You learn, you want to? Sorry, you learn? If you do, okay. The e learners are going to have a chance at it. Um, so, how can we do this here? Right here. Pardon me, one reason. So, here you go, you learn. There's an app. So 
So that was the orange projectile launcher. That data is the claim for the orange one. What about, let's change our independent variable, okay? How about a green launcher? Does green go faster? Green needs to go. Maybe that's a hypothesis. Is that scientific? Let's test it. Here you go, you learners. There you go. Ready? Aim. Fire. That one seemed like it went even further back, which means we would only get a higher. Uh, answer. So by my judgment, that was something more like, you know, 60 centimeters. So as the scientists conducting the laboratory investigation, we can kind of say, all right, do we want to just sort of charge through with this analysis here? You know, do we want to do something that's going to give us more accurate sort of results? Maybe we should do something. So like I was mentioning, have this video camera up here to really get accurate sort of readings. The other thing that we could do is switch out the pendulum, use something like this kind of right here. So another Velcro target, but this one actually has coin masses, so it's more inert. Okay, so this thing is going to weigh more, and therefore. It's not going to displace as much. And so maybe we could get more sort of precise readings by just noticing a tinier change. Now, typically, we want to kind of measure larger values. We want to vary the dependent variable over the greatest range possible, vary the independent variable over the greatest range possible, and kind of see what the dependent variable sort of give us with that. We don't really have an independent variable as kind of joking with saying, like, oh, the color of the you know, weapon. Okay, well, because these are actually different sort of projectile launches, even though they're manufactured the same, they might have slightly different, you know springiness to the spring mechanism that's sort of in here that's what that's sort of the source of the energy so i'd like to sort of move this back and here the click and then that spring is, is sort of locked in place and then the the trigger sort of releases that okay so that's the sort of it releases the spring that pushes the forward and so perhaps by using a more inert um pendulum we wouldn't see this drastic displacement where again it's like we kind of lose the the triangle if we're getting this this kind of have to see what the sunlight comes. Like. It's sort of slack in the line, you know. So it's going back like back there. All right. If it moves back and it's like slack in the line, you don't really have that hypotenuse. Is there another way that we could check this? You know, ballistic pendulum, whole bunch of calculations, we get a conclusion. But is there another way to perhaps check that claim? Anytime you can sort of independently um, come up with the same conclusion using a different method, a different technique, and just kind of get the confidence that we're on the right track with our answers, if the answers are close. If one's way different than the other, it's like, well, which one can we trust? Maybe we need to do a third, you know, sort of measurement. And the most debated sort of scientific claims today, for example, about like distance to stars, it's, it's incredibly difficult to measure distance to stars in astronomy. And there's a lot of debate about sort of what are the best methods to do that. And, and a lot of things in astronomy depend upon our knowledge of how far away you know, stars are because they appear more bright the closer they are. So 
So let's go ahead and use the same projectile launcher. And what we'll do, so over here now, I'm going to set up a photo gate timer. So you may recall that if we know sort of the width of a marble, or in this case, the length of a dart, that's going to be the thing that's going to break our photo gate as it flies through. So if I just fire the dart through this photo gate, this will give me the time, right? The photo gate timer tells me the time. This length will be the distance. This length here will be the distance, but then distance divided by time would also be velocity. So let's see if we can't get something anywhere near 21.2 meters per second. Calipers. You too, you see what we deal with here? Another day in the life, YouTube. That's how it goes around here. All right. So remember how to read this. We're looking at this line right here. You always can just kind of zero it out to see, like, okay, that line is on zero right now. I want to pinch the object that I'm measuring between the prongs of the calipers. So at its widest point. This this foam is you know somewhat flexible, so you want to like pinch it down to where it's like compressing it. And then if you look there, you can see just like I can. Now that's 7.5 centimeters or can be a second. 7.5. Okay, so looking at that line right there. Okay. You can see that seven is back here. So it's not like 7.5. So 7.5 centimeters is So now we're going to determine the velocity. It's just distance over time, 0 0.075 meters, right? 7.5 centimeters. So it's going to pass through a photo gate timer, right? So I'm just sort of distance divided by time. So let's go ahead and get that ready. It doesn't have a shirt pocket. A pretty good shot right there, right? Let's worry about the science too, not just the cinematography choice. This one went wrong. <laughs> it just keeps on ticking. Try it again.
it reads zero. Okay, it is working. Um, You can imagine there's some uncertainties in this also, but 0 0.0061 seconds, okay? If the the entire length of the dart doesn't break the photo gate and only so sort of like a piece of it is, then we might, you know, then, then it might sort of record time um, more quickly or, or sort of the value will be lower than the actual time that it took the 7.5 centimeter dart to pass through. So we got to keep that in mind too. Again, looking at it like a, a slow motion video camera sort of recording that and sort of seeing does the, the sort of full length of the dart sort of pass through where that eyelet is in the photo gate will be a way to just sort of make sure you're getting accurate data. But for our purposes, we'll sort of say, okay, well, 0 0.0061 seconds. So we have another way to sort of get to the same conclusion. We've got 0 0.075 meters divided by 0 0.0061 seconds. Remember a moment ago, a whole bunch of calculations, we claim that the initial velocity is 0 0.0061 meters per second. But this gives us 12.3. So based on the photo gate timer, we can make a claim that the velocity was 12.3 meters per second. Based on the ballistic pendulum, we can make a claim that it was a bit faster. And now you as the, the students sort of analyzing these, this experiment, these results to try to think about, you know, what are some sources of uncertainty in this lab? What are some suggestions for improvement? That's always good to sort of uh, critique the lab. But for today's lab work, make sure that you've got at least the, the sort of calculation that we did here. Tomorrow, I will have extra apparatus out humorous. If there's ever a day where you're like, you know, I can go to campus for a day, okay, if you're allowed on campus, tomorrow will be the day that I'll have apparatus out for you all to, to do this for yourself if you want to. Okay, it's not required if you're like, I don't want to touch my contact surfaces like lab apparatus, but if you really want to do that, this is a fun lab, right? Um, it's hardly ever the case where it's like, all right, physics class is over, surrender your weapons, and that's just a normal thing. Um, so, you know, some, some ballistic potential will continue on tomorrow. Um, if you want to just have sort of more practice with this, but we can just make a claim as you see fit based on if you want to average the two velocities that we got, maybe that's appropriate. You trust sort of one more than the other. You make a claim based on your judgment, okay? Supported with evidence, which are the calculations themselves. And then the reasoning for this one, the reasoning is very straightforward, right? Velocity is defined as distance divided by time. So if we measure distance and time, we can calculate. That's the same lab we did the very first week with the bowling ball. No distance, no time, get velocity as a ratio. The reasoning behind the ballistic pendulum method is a lot more involved in the focus of really this, this lesson with as we're studying the great conservation laws, namely momentum and energy. So we kind of finished energy. This week we're dealing with momentum. And remember, as we come back in the spring break, we'll continue to, to study momentum. So tomorrow will be sort of a bonus lab day for if you can collect your own data and fire, you know, the the darts into the ballistic pendulum. And then Friday, there's no Zoom call on Friday. Um, so it'll just be a work day to finish off these calculations, to write up your CERs, to submit your work for the week. Um, I will not be here with Friday. Okay. I'll be on campus tomorrow. Here in class, so you have a question. All right. We'll see you next time.